Hello, I'm Cara Dahl Russell. Recently, I did a pre-concert lecture before an Advent Lessons and Carol service. And one of the works on the program that I spoke about was a setting of a poem by Christina Rossetti, Come Thou Dost Say to Angels. Within the structure, it kind of shifted the focus from the eternal focus to the here and now with a literal preparation and welcome to the supernatural. And it gave me, of course, the opportunity to talk a bit about the life and the faith of Christina Rossetti. She lived from 1830 to 1894, and many of her poems have been set as hymns. Perhaps her two best known are In the Bleak Midwinter, in a setting by Gustav Holst, and Love Came Down at Christmas. Today, many of us know her name and her poetry because of the growth and interest in female writers that surged in the 1970s and that has grown into full programs of focus in women's studies. Because these classes are often considered to be part of a, quote, feminist, unquote, curriculum, she has often been lumped in with feminist writers and there have been inferences about her life and her work which she probably would have found personally appalling. She came from a learned family. Her father was an academic who was one of the foremost authorities on the works of Dante and one of her brothers, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, was a painter whose name is still recognized today. The importance of Christina Rossetti's faith as influential in her life and art cannot be overstated. More than half of her poetic output is devotional, and the works of her later years in both poetry and prose are almost exclusively so. The inconstancy of human love, the vanity of earthly pleasures, renunciation, individual unworthiness, and the perfection of divine love are recurring themes in her poetry. She does have several poems about rejection of men in her life, and this was very much tied to her faith. Factually, she was a devout Anglican, and it was central to her life. One of her suitors was rejected for being Catholic. He even converted for her, but this was not enough, and he eventually converted back. The next man, did, have, did not have enough of her religious life. Now, it's likely that her lifelong chronic illness put an added damper on this prospect of marriage and the expectations of a wife in her day. Rossetti had bouts of serious illness throughout her life. It's worth mentioning she did not have a particularly short life, especially for her time period she lived to be 64. For her day, that was a long life, but it was a life of chronic illness. Her brother William wrote a biography of her in which he insists that we cannot understand her unless we recognize that she, quote, was an almost constant and often a sadly smitten invalid, unquote. He wanted people to understand that any morbidity in her poetry was a reflection of her illness and not necessarily of her innate personality. <coughs> In her late teens, she had a mysterious illness and weakness that was mostly written off as her not wanting to work. But then it became clear later in her life that it was probably a foreshadowing of the disease that really fully showed itself in her 40s. The women's suffrage movement in England grew from 1872 to 1927, only the last 20 years of her life. And in the first two years of that movement, Rossetti was 40 and she was dangerously ill with a completely debilitating symptoms including lack of consciousness. Today it's understood that what she had is, was 
is known today as Graves' disease. Although Rossetti recovered, the threat of a relapse always remained, and the crisis left her appearance permanently altered and her heart weakened. Then later in 1892, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent a mastectomy that was performed in her own home. The cancer recurred the following year and after months of acute suffering, she died in December of 1894. Her poetry is focused on religion, but in the simplicity of her language, there is also an intense practicality. It's a focus on living directly in concert and communion with your faith. Some have referred to her as a Christian mystic. And the history and lives of female Christian mystics is worth a talk all on its own. While Christian mysticism often relies on visions and voices, and she did have some of this as part of her illness, she very much thought of spiritual mysticism as an empowering agent, a spur to action, similar to Joan of Arc, but less hearty. To understand her work, we also have to realize that she was very much a creature of her time. The Victorian fascination with a fantasy of fairies, goblins, childhood mythologies were powerfully prevalent in the culture and in publications of the day. They were a part of how the culture retained a childishness in women that was so desirable. These books sat side by side on the bed table with darker Gothic pot boilers, and these cultural elements and influences went hand in hand. So it's really important that we not read modern interpretation into her poetry. And even during her own day, when the Gothic thrillers often had a sexual subtext made more explicit by the woodcuts and illustrations, her poem, Goblin Market, was often considered to be either a sexual analogy of one sister being led astray or lesbianism. Ironically, just as frequently, it was said to be a religious analogy for crucifixion and the cross. She was pretty horrified by both. With this cultural, childlike way of viewing fairies and goblins, she insisted she meant neither of those things. She meant for this poem to be taken literally. With the poem that we're talking about today, and come thou dost say to angels, it is a literal invocation, an invitation and welcoming to angels as literal beings. It is a call to the renunciation of things that distract us from the purity of mindset we need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. For us, even more so, it's a call away from the cynical assumptions of our worldliness to a practical preparation for the sublime.